Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We are interested in the limit as n tends to infinity, sum k from 1 to n, k over n to the power k. Let's start by doing the following investigation. Consider the function g of x. g of x is x to the power xn, where x is between 0 and 1. This function is related to our summation here, because if we take k to the power n to the power k, this can be written as k over n to the power k over n times n. So x here, which is between 0 and 1, plays the role of k over n. g of x can be written as e to the power xn len x. When we differentiate, we have the same function again, and then we need to differentiate this. n is a constant, and the derivative of x len x is len x plus x over x, which is 1. The first derivative of this function is 0 only when len x is equal to minus 1. That is when x is equal to e to the minus 1. If x is smaller than this value, then this quantity here is negative. If x is greater than e to the minus 1, then this quantity here is positive. Over its domain, the function g of x has a derivative that is negative, then 0 at e to the minus 1, then positive. This means that the function g of x itself decreases, and it has a local minimum at e to the minus 1, and then it increases to 1 when x is equal to 1. The function looks something like this. And this is the point e to the minus 1. Suppose that n is a positive integer that is greater than or equal to 8. And also assume that x is restricted to this closed interval from 2 over n. So when n is equal to 8, this is 1 fourth. And if n is above 8, then this is less than 1 over 4. And then the upper end of the interval is 1 minus the cube root of n over n. If n is equal to 8, then the cube root of 8 is 2. That's 1 minus 2 over 8. 1 minus 1 fourth, that's 3 fourth. Note that as n increases, 2 over n goes down towards 0, and 1 minus the cube root of n divided by n approaches 1. We are interested actually not in the minimum of g of x, but in the maximum. Because the function looks like this, over this interval, which contains e to the minus 1, g of x is maximum at either end point. So because now we are investigating an interval, and this interval is from 2 to the n, and n is greater than or equal to 8, and here this is 1 minus the cube root of n over n, then if we want the maximum of the function, it's either achieved at 2 over n or at 1 minus the cube root of n divided by n. If we put x equal to 2 over n, we have 2 over n to the power 2 over n times n. This is equal to 4 divided by n squared. And then we can also put this 1 minus n to the minus 2 over 3. We can put it here and we get this quantity. g of x has a maximum which is either 4 over n squared or this quantity here. I claim that there is a threshold value, let's call it big N or something, such that for every small n greater than or equal to big N, this term here is below 4 over n squared. For those large n values, we are sure that the maximum of this function g of x on this interval occurs at 2 over n, and the maximum is 4 over n squared. Definitely, it is not clear why I'm doing this, given that this is our problem, but you know, it will hopefully become clear after we finish this sort of analysis. We want just to come up with this result, that if n exceeds a certain value, then this function g of x over this interval will reach its maximum of 4 over n squared at x equal to 2 over n. The argument that we need to make is that if n is large enough, this guy will become less than 4 over n squared. To make things clearer, let's define z to be n to the power 1 over 3, the cube root of n. And if we are considering n greater than or equal to 8, then z is greater than or equal to 2. Move this n squared to this side, and now whenever you find n to the power 1 over 3, replace it by z. So n squared becomes z to the power 6. And then this n to the minus 2 over 3, that's z to the minus 2. And we can also change those n's here and write them down in terms of z. n is z cubed, and n to the minus 2 over 3, that's z to the minus 2. We want to show that for z that is large enough, this left-hand side is less than 4. We have the inequality that e to the theta is greater than or equal to 1 plus theta for every real valued theta. We can apply this inequality to this bracket here. According to this inequality, 1 minus z to the minus 2 is always less than or equal to e to the power minus z to the minus 2. This left-hand side is upper bounded by z to the power 6. And then rather than having this base, 1 minus z to the minus 2, we have e to the minus z to the minus 2. And then we have this exponent here. This becomes z to the 6, e to the power minus z plus z to the minus 1 when we do this multiplication. If z is greater than or equal to 2, z to the minus 1 is less than or equal to 1 half. This here is e to the minus z times e to the, to the minus 1. 
if z is greater than or equal to 2, then this is less than or equal to e to the power 1 half. That is the square root of e. And the square root of e is less than or equal to 2. The left-hand side of this inequality is upper bounded by z to the power 6 e to the minus z times 2. If this upper bound on this left-hand side is itself less than 4, then this left-hand side is less than 4 for sufficiently large z values. Is it true that for sufficiently large z that z to the power 6 e to the minus z is less than 2? And the answer is yes. And this is from a limit argument. What is the limit as z tends to infinity of z to the power 6 times e to the minus z? Or we can write e to the power z. What is this limit? This limit is zero. We have something that grows polynomially in the numerator and a function that grows exponentially in the denominator. We can apply L'Hopital's rule. We can differentiate. We are here in an infinity over infinity situation, but we can differentiate once to get 6z to the 5 over e to the z. Still infinity over infinity. We can differentiate again. We can do this six times and we will get 6 factorial in the numerator and e to the z in the denominator. Finally, when we take the limit as z tends to infinity, then we have zero. Thus, it must get less than two and less than one and less than one half and less than one over one trillion and so on because it's approaching zero. This thing decays towards zero. If it decays towards zero, then there must be a certain threshold value for z such that above that value, z to the power six e to the minus z is less than two. Indeed, this side here, or if we write things in terms of n, whenever n gets large enough, then this left-hand side will be less than four over n squared. We can actually verify this numerically. We can ask something like Mathematica uh, to solve this inequality. And Mathematica will say that if n exceeds 3,259, then indeed this inequality will always be true. For our purposes, it is really enough to say that there is some large number. And if a small n is that large number or more, then this inequality is true. But actually, we can know what this number is. What is the idea? The idea is now that this function has a maximum. If n is large enough, the maximum is 4 over n squared. Why is this relevant to our summation? Let's take our summation and let's focus on the summation index being between 2 and n minus the cube root of n. So the range is from 1 to n. We will study what will happen if k is between 2 and n minus the cube root of n. Note that for this range of k, we have that k over n is living between 2 over n and 1 minus the cube root of n over n which is this interval that we have studied earlier. Our summand is k over n to the power k, which can be written in terms of our g function. k over n is x in our initial investigation. If n is large enough, then we know that this g of k over n, for every k in this range, which means that k over n is in this interval, we know that this g of k over n can be upper bounded by 4 over n squared. This is the max of g when n is large enough. And then we have the number of terms in the summation. The number of terms in the summation can be upper bounded just by n. This summation here, which is our original sum, but it is from 2 to n minus the cube root of n. This summation is upper bounded by 4 over n. This upper bound goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Note that we are talking about a quantity that is non-negative. It's upper bounded by 4 over n, which tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. By the sandwich theorem, we know that this summation here will go to 0 as n goes to infinity. So that's the relevance of the first part. In this summation here, we need like, to focus on a particular range. The summation, if we take it from 2 to n minus the cube root of n, simply all those terms together will tend to 0 as n tends to infinity. If we have our summation, when k is equal to 1, the term that we have here is 1 over n, which also goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. The limit of interest is the limit as n tends to infinity of this summation. We can just start from n minus the cube root of n to n. The value of our limit is this limit here. The purpose of the first part of this exercise is simply to say that rather than investigating the summation with n terms for reasons that will become clear because we will try to employ the dominated convergence theorem uh, for the rest of the problem, we prepared the ground by saying that we don't need to account for all those terms. In fact, the relevant terms are the terms such that the summation index k is between n minus the cube root of n to n. Do a change of summation index, v is equal to n minus k. Then we have our summation v now is from 0 to the cube root of n, and k over n becomes n minus v over n. That's 1 minus v over n. And then this k here becomes n minus v. We can write the sum as a sum from 0 to infinity. And inside the summation, we will have this indicator function. This indicator function is equal to 1 if v is less than or equal to the cube root of n and is 0 otherwise.
we will try to employ the dominated convergence theorem so that we can take the limit inside. We have a limit and we have an infinite sum and it is not always valid that we interchange them. The problem gets more manageable if we can take the limit inside, but we need to justify this step. And the justification will come from the dominated convergence theorem, which tells us the following. We can interchange the limit and the infinite sum if we upper bound the sum by a quantity that depends only on V and not on N. So our upper bound on the magnitude of the sum must depend only on V and not on the variable with respect to which we are taking the limit. Then it must be the case that the summation V from zero to infinity of the upper bound, which depends only on V, this sum must give us a finite value. If this is true, then we can go back to our original problem and we can take the limit inside. If we take the limit inside, it's as if we are fixing V and saying what will happen as we push N towards infinity. The first order of business is to try to upper bound the sum or specifically the magnitude of the sum. Here things are real variable non-negative, so the magnitude is the quantity itself. We need an upper bound in which there is no N and hopefully that this upper bound itself is summable. Let's apply the inequality that we have applied earlier that one plus theta is less than or equal to e to the power theta for any real valued theta. So one minus v over n, this is upper bounded by e to the minus v over n. And this is equal to e to the minus v plus v squared over n. Note that this n here is very annoying because we want our upper bound to be a function of v only. We want n to disappear because n is the variable here in the limit. Okay. Let's take our sum as a whole. This is this one minus V over N to the power N minus V. And then we have the indicator. And the indicator tells us that V is less than or equal to the cube root of N. Well, if this is the case, then this magnitude times the indicator is upper bounded by the indicator times E to the minus V plus N to the power two over three over N. Let's see. The indicator is either zero or one. If the indicator is zero, we have that zero is less than or equal to zero, which is a correct statement. If the indicator is one, this means that this guy here, which is e to the minus v times e to the v squared over n, if the indicator is one, v is less than or equal to the cube root of n. So I can say that this is less than or equal to this guy, copy and paste, and then this is e to the power n to the power two over three divided by n. This is this upper bound here. Then we can get rid of n because this is e to the minus v, e to the power n to the power minus one over three. N is a positive integer. So this quantity here is upper bounded by one. And my upper bound is E to the power one times E to the minus V. And the indicator itself after doing its function can be upper bounded by one. It's a zero or one, we can just replace it by one. Now we have an upper bound, which is E times E to the minus V and we don't have N. Let me justify the initial steps in the solution. Why do we have these initial steps? Suppose that we do not do them. If we don't do them, then V will be less than or equal to N. If V is upper bounded by N, then we cannot do this step here. To do this step, we need it to obtain this result that in fact, our limit will depend on some significant terms in the sum. And there will be terms that tend to zero as N tends to infinity. We ended up with the summation that stops at the cube root of N. And now it helped us to upper bound the sum. The upper bound itself is summable. This is convergent geometric series. The sum is finite, that's it. We can now, by the authority of the dominated convergence theorem, take the limit inside. There are three quantities that have N, the indicator itself. When you take the limit, you think of V as fixed, V as a constant. If V is kept fixed and you are pushing N towards infinity, sooner or later, the cube root of N will catch up with V and will exceed V so that the indicator becomes one. For every V, this indicator tends to one as N tends to infinity. Then we have one minus V over N to the minus V. Recall that we have one minus V over N to the power N minus V. I have split this into two limits. In this limit, note that V is kept constant. When we take the limit, simply V over N will tend towards zero and this thing will tend also towards one. Finally, we have this term here. One minus V over N to the power N. This is E to the minus V in the limit. This is E to the power limit as N tends to infinity of len one minus V over N over one over N. We can apply L'Hopital's rule once, and this is e to the limit as n tends to infinity, one over one minus v over n, and then v over n squared, and downstairs we have minus one over n squared. This one over n squared, go with this one over n squared, as n tends to infinity, this tends to one, and we end up with e, and then this minus sign, and this v, that's e to the minus v. Thus, if we do the limit first, we end up with e to the minus v. Now we can sum. 
that's a convergent geometric series with ratio e to the minus one. And so this summation here is one over one minus e to the minus one. This limit here is one over one minus e to the minus one. 